Um, now I get the honor of being able to introduce to you uh, a guest speaker that we have today. So this is a huge blessing for me. Uh, many of you know I took this week to um, kind of work on planning for next year, which takes a lot of time. So um, Saul Rexius is coming up. Go ahead and come on up, Saul. Saul is the director for the Salt Company, um, which is a college ministry based out of Cornerstone Church in Ames. So um, you've been with them about five years now, right? That's right. right. They have planted 22 college campus churches across the country. Uh, amen. So that's been a, a huge focus really for Cornerstone Church. Um, and of course, uh, over the last five years, uh, certainly for Saul. So yeah. we're very thankful that uh, he is here to, to bring us God's word. And so we're going to go ahead and pray for him as we also pray for our offering and the rest of the service. So let's pray. Father God, thank you uh, for the tremendous blessing of being here together as a church family. Not just, not just our believers here in North Iowa, but also um, new friends that are coming to, to worship with us. I pray, Father, that you would bless the the offering, I pray that you would bless uh, Saul's offering of bringing your word to us today, that your spirit would work here powerfully uh, through him and through your word. Um, and we pray all of this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. If you guys have a Bible, you can open up, open up to 1 Peter chapter 2. That's where we're going to be today. I know you're going through a series in James, but just going to uh, do a little park stop here on First Peter chapter 2, just look at a couple verses, a couple of my favorite verses in all of scripture. Just a little bit more uh, about me, actually, I was born and raised in Eugene, Oregon. Anybody ever spent much time in Oregon? Okay, three of us, great. Perfect. I'm the third of four kids. The fourth kid came about 10 minutes after me because we're twins. Uh, so I have a twin brother, born and raised there in Eugene, Oregon. I was a big duck fan. Oregon Ducks, uh, which they're having a great football season, and then actually played football for one year, my first year of college at University of Oregon, and then ran track for a year. And then after that, I uh, began to sense the Lord leading me toward uh, vocational ministry. And so I began, you know, volunteering more in church and started preaching there, and then got the opportunity to go to Western Seminary in Portland for my Bible training. And then in 2010, I went on a study tour to Jerusalem. And on the first day of the trip, there was this girl, you can see where this is going, and she just couldn't stop following me around, so <laughs> something like that. A year later, uh, we were married, and she's over here, that's my wife, Lizzie, and uh, we got married in Mobile, Alabama, which is where she's from. And we've got four little kids here with us today. We also have an older adopted daughter, but four of them are, are here with us today, uh, two in service and then two um, back with uh, child care. So yeah, that's, that's just a little bit about me. Um, but before we read those two verses together, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever wondered what someone else is thinking about you? Of course you have, probably right now thinking about that. Have you ever thought, man, what does that person think about me? Maybe it's, you know, a, a classmate or a teacher or a boss or a coworker or someone in your family, a friend, a neighbor. What does that person think about me? I mean, there's something inside of us that we kind of want to know what other people think about us. What does that person think about me? I remember 11 years ago, um, I was dating a girl. And, you know, dating is a serious thing. And so, you know, you're trying to figure out if this is for life or not. Like, is this going to end in marriage or is this going to end some other way? And so, you know, I was actually in class one day and I was just taking notes, trying to kind of like journal out my thoughts on the situation. And so I did what maybe a lot of us do when we have a big decision in front of us. I made a pros and cons list. Just some pros and cons and kind of looked at it. And look, look, there were a lot more pros than cons. And so I decided to stick with the relationship and... I, I shut up the, the binder that it was in, put it in my backpack, you know, never to be seen again. <laughs> Until one day that girlfriend uh, came with me to class just for fun, and she, she wanted to take notes on what the teacher was saying too, so she asked me uh, for a piece of paper. So of all the papers she could have chosen inside of that journal, you know the one that she opened up to, and so... About 10 minutes into the class, I realized what was happening, you know, and she kind of gave me a look, and I was like, oh, no, just instant sweat, nausea, heat flash, everything. 
the whole thing. And needless to say, we had a nice little discussion that night about what I really thought about her, because now she knew. But you guys, guess what? Now we have five kids, and she's sitting right over here. So it worked out. It worked out. Still more pros than cons. Still more pros than cons, but it was her, and so we figured that one out. But here's the deal. We all, we all want to know what people think about us. Sometimes we're even obsessed with it, trying to think about what someone else thinks. It's so natural to think about that, but I want to challenge you with this. It is so much more important to know what God thinks about us, to know what the creator of the universe thinks of you. You also have pros and cons. And the Bible tells us about that. God has a book, too. God has a journal, too, with pros and cons about really who we are, what's wrong with us, and what's right with us. And so I want to share a little bit about that today from 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. This is not the only thing that God says about us. This is not the only thing that God thinks about us, but this is a a really important passage for understanding how God views us. So I'm going to read it, and then we'll kind of work back through it together. Here's what it says. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So many Bible commentators would say that this is kind of the peak and center of the entire book of 1 Peter. That everything that's set up to it is kind of leading up to this. And everything that comes after this is really the implication of what this says here. And so there's actually six different statements of our identity just in those two verses. Did you see what they were? You're a chosen race. God chose you. You're a royal priesthood. Priests would stand in the gap between humanity and God, and that's what we do too. We stand in the gap, and we bring the the desires of God to the people, and we bring the needs of the people to God. We are a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're different. We pursue holiness and righteousness and purity, which is increasingly more and more unpopular. We're a treasured people. We, we matter to God. We are a, p- a people for his possession. We are God's people. We belong to God. We are a people of mercy, not just that we've received mercy, but we also give it out freely. That's who you are. I like, I'd like you to think about it this way. That's not just who you are in terms of an identity statement. That's your name. It's more personal than just something that's true about you. That is your name. Did you know in the book of John, how John often refers to himself. He doesn't say, I, John. He'll say, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Instead of putting his name, he put what God thought about him. The disciple whom Jesus loved. And that's not just true for John. That's true for any disciple. That's true for any person who follows Christ. You are the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's his name. There's another reason why I like to think of this as our name. I don't know if you notice this, but there in verse 10, once you were not a people, now you are. Once you had not received mercy, now you have. That's actually a reference back to the book of Hosea. So in the book of Hosea, it's a time, a dark time in Israel's history, and God calls Hosea to marry a woman who's not faithful to him. And they have a few kids together, and he, the daughter is called Loruhama, which means no mercy. And his son is called Loami, which means not my people. Those were their actual literal names. No mercy, not my people. God was telling Hosea about the state of the people of Israel. Not receiving mercy, not my people. But now Peter is writing to the people of God saying, the curse has been reversed. Now you have received mercy. You're not lo Ruhama and lo Ami. You are people of mercy. You are my people. What was true for the Israelites in the days of Hosea is no longer true for us in Christ. We are his people, people of mercy. That's our name. You see this also in the life of Peter, the one who's writing this. This is very personal for him because remember his name was Simon. Jesus renamed him. He says, you're now Peter, the rock. Jesus changed his name to tell him something about who he is now. 
it's not just that he added something to his personality. He was telling him who he really is now in Christ. In some Christian cultures, they take this very literally. I remember when I was on a mission trip in Singapore, and a lot of the Christians there who were uh, converted out of a different kind of religion were given a Christian name at their baptism. So I don't, I don't think y'all do that here, but I don't know, I'm new here. Um, a lot of churches in, in the Western world don't do that, but there's something that's right about that. There's something that's right. Like when you come out of that water, you're a new person. There's something that's new about you. You have a new name. And so I'll be honest, I used to think this stuff wasn't really a big deal. I, I didn't really think too much about why it's important of, you know, who I am in Christ. And people would talk about, you know, you're a son and daughter of the king. And I just, it wouldn't quite land with me. It kind of seemed mushy. But then I started realizing something. I started realizing that who you think you are affects everything else you do. It really does. If you don't believe me, watch what happens when a coach only tells his team that they're trash. Watch how motivated they are at practice and in games. Watch what happens when a child is told his whole life, you're a mistake. Who you think you are matters. Watch what happens when a wife treats her husband every day like he's stupid. Watch what happens when a father never says the words, I love you, I believe in you, and I'm proud of you to his son and daughter. Who you think you are affects everything else you do. Watch what happens when you tell yourself, I'm a failure, I'm worthless, I'm ugly, I don't matter. You know, during World War II, in order to demoralize their enemies, Nazi Germany refused to call prisoners of war by their names. Instead, they just used numbers. So they, w they would lose all sense of who they are, not even try to fight back. The Nazis understood the power of your name. You need to know who you are. So I hope none of us think we're too macho or too mature for that. Because who you think you are affects everything else you do. God cares about the way you view you. And so a few years ago, I became more and more convinced of this idea that, man, who you think you are really matters. Who God says you are really matters that you get that in your mind. And so I'm kind of a list person. I love a good list. And so I made a list, actually, an A to Z list of who I am in Christ. And so I want to read for you that list right now, but just a little side footnote. I actually do have biblical references for each one of these. I, I won't say those all right now. You can check me later if you want the full list. You guys ready for this? A through Z, who I am in Christ? Here we go. Because of Jesus, I am A, accepted, adopted, approved, and alive. I am an ambassador for Christ. I am B, beloved, blessed, born again, and a bond servant of Jesus. I am C, chosen of God, child of God, citizen of heaven, and crucified with Christ. I am D, delivered from darkness, dead to sin, and a disciple of Jesus. I am elect. I am forgiven and free. I am God's workmanship. I am an heir through God and hidden in Christ. I am the I, image of God and forever in Christ. J, I'm justified by faith. K, I am kept for Jesus and known by God. L, I'm the light of the world and I am loved by the Father. M, I'm more than a conqueror and a minister of reconciliation. N, I am a new creation. I'm not ashamed, not forsaken, not condemned, and I am never alone. O, I'm an oak of righteousness. Once was lost, but now I'm found. P, I'm a priest of the Most High and I'm pleasing to God. Q, I'm qualified by the Father. R, I am redeemed, righteous, rescued, ransomed, and reconciled. S, I'm a saint and a salt of the earth. T, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit, and I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. U, I am under grace and united with Jesus. V, I am victorious through Christ and vindicated by God. W, I'm a witness of God's power, a worshiper of Jesus, and washed by the Spirit. Now, I had to stretch a little on these last three. X, I am an ex-enemy of God, Romans 5.10. Y, I am yoked with Christ. 
Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, and Z, I am zealous for good works and for the glory of God, Titus two fourteen. That's who I am. And that's who you are in him. And that's not just true on your best days, on your Christian rock star days. That's true on your darkest days, on your worst days. All those things are true of you if you are in Christ. Some people look outward for their identity. What does culture say I'm supposed to be? What do my friends want me to be? What does my family expect to be? Some of us look outward. Some of us look inward. What do I want? What are my accomplishments? What are my achievements? What are my preferences, my opinions? Maybe that's who I am. But Christians don't look outward or inward for their identity. They look upward. Who does God say that I am? What does God think about me? We sing about this. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. It's true. And it's my conviction that not knowing this, who you are in Christ, is the root cause of a thousand other sins, fears, and insecurities. I mean, think about it. When you forget that your body belongs to God and that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, you will give yourself away. If you're not convinced of God's approval, you'll live in paralyzing insecurity until you get it from the people around you. When you forget that you're never alone, you will live with fear and, and struggle with worry and anxiety. I believe you could trace back every fear, sin, and insecurity in your life back to that you have either misunderstood or forgotten who you are. And so my job as a pastor and preacher is first of all to remind you of who Jesus is and secondly to remind you of who you are. When I was early in ministry, I thought it was all about just telling people how to think. And that's part of it. And then I thought, well, maybe it's telling people how to act, what they should do. And that's part of it too. And then I thought, well, maybe it's about helping people feel the right things. And all of those things are true and fine. But the most important thing for a pastor to do is help people know who Jesus is and who they are in him. One of my favorite Disney movies is Moana. And one of my favorite scenes is when she takes on this lava monster named Taka. Now, if you haven't seen it, let me just break it down real quick. So the short story behind Taka, this lava monster, is that she was once a beautiful island named Tefiti. And I, I promise this is going toward the gospel. Just hold on. So beautiful island named Tefiti, and then Maui, who's like the Dwayne the Rock Johnson character in the, in the movie, um, he stole her heart. And so she gets real upset about the, Her heart is this shiny green rock thing. Um, so he steals it. She gets super mad, and she takes on a new name. She was Tafiti, now she's Taka, and she turns into this raging lava monster because Maui stole the heart. Now I'd be upset if someone stole my heart too, but now she's trying to ruin the whole ocean world. That's what's happening in the story of Moana. So Moana is trying to restore the heart, help Taka remember who she is. That's the backstory of then how she's approaching this monster. So first, Maui, the big tough guy, tries to just overcome this lava monster uh, with brute strength, and he gets absolutely wrecked, destroyed. It does not work. But then Moana takes a very different approach. First, she holds up the heart so Taka can see it, and then she does what any good Disney princess should do. She sings. And then the sea parts, she walks toward the monster, and I love what she sings to this raging lava monster who was once a beautiful island. Here's what she sings. I have crossed the horizon to find you. I know your name. They've stolen the heart from inside you, but this does not define you. This is not who you are. You know who you are preach, Moana. That's good. She says, you're not Taka. You're actually Tefiti. This doesn't define you. This last thousand years or however long it's been of being so angry and so against everything, that's a de that does not define you. That's not your defining moment. Sometimes that's so hard for us to remember. Our defining moments aren't our worst moments. 
It's easy to live as if the absolute defining moment of my life was the worst moment. I want you to know, if that's you, I just want you to know, your defining moment is not the worst day or the worst moment or the, the bad decision you made. Your defining moment actually has very little to do with you. Your defining moment happened 2,000 years ago on a hill outside of Jerusalem when the Lord of glory was crucified for your worst moment. So Moana reminds the lava monster, this doesn't define you. That's not who you are. And so at the risk of sounding like a heretic, I just I want to at least suggest that what Moana sings over to Ka is something of what Peter is saying to us. This does not define you. And all the mistakes you made last week, last night, this morning, it doesn't define you. It's not who you are. The message of 1 Peter 2, 9 is not stop it, don't, you'll regret it. The message of 1 Peter 2, 9 is that's not who you are. This does not define you. You know, I think a lot of us view our fight against sin like we've seen in the movies or in the cartoons where it's got, you got Jesus on one side and you got the devil on one side of your shoulder and Satan's over here saying, just do it. And then Jesus is over here saying, no, don't do it. Just do it, don't do it. And that's how we think the battle of sin goes. And I want to suggest to you that it's not quite that simple. That actually the Bible describes our fight for holiness more like this. Satan is over here saying, God doesn't care about you. God hates you. God wishes you were different. God's disappointed. God, God's not even paying attention to you. Just go ahead and do it. And then Jesus is over here. And he's not saying don't do it. He's saying that's not who you are. It's not who you are. Here's another way to say it. Satan knows your name, but calls you by your sin. Jesus knows your sin, but calls you by your name. So the next time you find yourself thinking thoughts like this, God doesn't care, God doesn't see, God doesn't love me, You're, I'm not worth it, I'll never make it, I'm not enough, I'm terrible. First, you should say to yourself, that doesn't sound like Jesus. My shepherd doesn't talk to me like that. My shepherd doesn't just tell me who I'm not and about all the failures I've made. He tells me who I am. He called me by my name, not by my sin, not by my shame. So you got to kill that thought before that thought kills you. You got to talk back to yourself. Talk back to the devil who gets in your head and tries to, to get you to believe lies and talk back in Jesus' name. Maybe what you should, you should do is just send yourself the same text message that you would send to somebody who was having the same doubts you were having. To somebody who was going through the same kind of lack of self-confidence and shame and guilt. What would you say to that person? Hopefully something like, Brother, sister, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. And instead of sending it to that friend, just send it to yourself. Talk back to yourself. Remind yourself of who you really are. Maybe you need to keep a list of those ABCs on your refrigerator so when you wake up in the morning to grab your coffee creamer, you remind yourself who you really are. Maybe like me, you just need to keep a great worship playlist on your Spotify playlist app so when you get in the car, you can just sing like a Disney princess to yourself and remind yourself of who you really are and fight sin, not just with willpower and grit the way that Maui did it in the movie, but fight it with your real name, your God-given, blood-bought name, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, treasured people, people of mercy. Whatever it takes, we got to remember who we are. We got to remember our name. So one final thing I want to say about some of those identity statements there. I want you to see that they're all plural. It's not like just one. It doesn't say you're a chosen person. It says you're a chosen race. It doesn't say you're a royal priesthood. No, you're a royal priesthood. It doesn't just say you're a holy individual. It says you're a holy nation. In other words, you're not the only person in the room that God sees this way. Following Christ is not just a me and Jesus thing, it's a we and Jesus thing. You could actually translate the word, when it says but you, you could actually translate that as y'all, because it's plural. I'm just waiting for that southern dialect Bible translation to come out. Y'all are chosen people. 
I reckon y'all should be holy because Jesus is fixing to come back soon. That's it. No more on that. Back on, back on. The story of the Bible is not me and Jesus. It's we and Jesus. We're in this together. We need each other because Christianity is a community project. We need each other. And you need to remember that it's true that the way you see yourself affects everything you do. But also, the way you see the person sitting next to you affects every interaction that you have with that person. So we want to see ourselves the way God sees. We want to think about ourselves the way God thinks about us, but we also want to think about our neighbor, right, as well. You all are a chosen people. But look now at verse 9 again. It says, so that, halfway through, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So this identity that we have in Christ, it's not just like a cul-de-sac, like it's all about you. No, no, there's a so that. There's a purpose to this name that you have, this identity that you have, and the purpose is to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We don't just speak the gospel, we also live it. So have you ever had to sit on the sideline? I, so I, I mentioned to you that I, I played football my, my first year of college at the University of Oregon, and I was sixth string, which means I was the backup to the backup to the backup to the backup to the backup, which is a hard place to be. That doesn't do wonders for your self-confidence. I was good enough to make the team, not good enough to get on the field. And I actually redshirted my first year, which means I would practice with the team and get beat up by all the starters, but never actually got on the field. Um, something happens in your mind when you're that low on the depth chart. When, you feel, when you're sixth string, it's like you just, you don't care that much. Like when your team loses, you don't really feel like you lost. But also when your team wins, you don't feel like you won because you kind of have this sideline mentality is what coaches call it, sideline mentality. You make a lot of mistakes when you have the sideline mentality. It's hard to maintain a sense of ownership and buy-in when you're in that sort of position. And for me, one of those things that I didn't take super seriously was my equipment. So a quick story, um, Oregon is a Nike school, which means we exclusively wear Nike. We have a unique contract with Nike, and so you wear Nike only, no exceptions, which was great, except for that one time that I wore Reeboks on the sideline, and that was a problem. I'll tell you this, in all my 15 years of competitive athletics, that was the most I've ever been yelled at, and I wasn't even playing, and it wasn't even a coach. It was the equipment manager that I got chewed out by, so I had to go apologize to Phil Knight at the halftime. It's a big problem. I didn't really have to. He's, he's the CEO of Nike. I didn't do that. I wasn't trying to cause a problem. I just had the sideline mentality. And so I was kind of checked out. So here's the thing. The sideline mentality is not just a sports problem. It's a church problem. A lot of us have the sideline mentality. Maybe some of us, maybe some of you feel like your role and your task and your voice and your gifts and your skills doesn't really matter. And so we end up with a sideline mentality. We're in Reeboks. So the only thing worse than the sideline mentality is the superstar mentality. <laughs> to get this Messiah complex, and so l let me just be clear, you're not the savior, you're not the point, you're not the head, only Jesus is. So it would be a massive mistake to think you're God's great gift to the world, but it would also be a massive dis mistake to think that your part doesn't really matter. So here's how we say this at Salt Company. Here is how I like to talk with our college students about this. I say, you matter, but you're not the point. Which is simple and profound. You actually matter. Your role, your voice, your resources, your skills, your personality, your connections, your, your influence. You matter, but you are not the point. You are not the point. I, I've seen people miss on either side of those. Some people, their whole life, they've only been told, you're not the point. You're not the point. Get out of my way. You're not the point. But some people, especially my generation, have only been told you matter. You matter. You matter. You're awesome. You're the best. Well, not always. So we need to live in between those two ditches and actually remember that, yes, we matter. And, yes, we're not the point. 
You know, in Matthew chapter 5, it's where the salt company gets its name. You're the salt of the earth. And then it says, and the light of the world. So light of the world, that's an interesting idea, right? I, m- I remember growing up in my house, we had a lot of lights in the house. And there was a couple of different, there's a lot of different kinds. I'm going to focus on two. Uh, there was the floodlight. The floodlight, which is kind of in a, you know, a place where you don't really notice the light itself or the bulb itself, but you see what it shines on. And that's the point of the floodlight, to shine light on other stuff. And then you've got the chandelier. The chandelier is kind of like the, the look at me light. It's only kind of there to give light. It's mostly there just to look pretty. So here's why I'm bringing this up. I think a lot of us, when we hear Jesus tell us, you're the light of the world, we think, oh, I'm the chandelier? No. No, you're not the chandelier of the world. You're not the beautiful thing that everybody should look at. You're the floodlight shining light on others, specifically on Jesus Christ. So we are not the chandeliers of the world. We're the floodlights of the world. John the Baptist uh, was one of the best examples of this in the New Testament You know, when he starts getting questioned about who he is, he's real quick to say who he's not. I'm not Elijah, and I am not the Christ. In other words, I am not the point. People are starting to think he's too special, so then he says, you know what? He must increase. I must decrease, because I'm not the chandelier. I'm the floodlight, and I'm shining light on him. And I think a lot of us would be helped to remind ourselves of that. Because sometimes it's hard to be a floodlight and not get noticed. Sometimes we want to be a chandelier. I, wanna, I love being a chandelier. That sounds nice. Get all the attention, but that's not the call on my life. Not to be a chandelier, but actually a floodlight. It's important not only to rehearse who we are, you know, all those ABCs. I'm ad- adopted, accepted, I'm blessed, I'm delivered. Yes, yeah, that's all true. That's great. It's also good to know who you're not. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the king. I'm not God, I'm not Jesus, I'm not the Lord of my life even. I'm not invincible, I have weakness. I'm not untouchable, I'm not a chandelier. And I'm not the point. You matter, but you're not the point. You are called to proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his light. Light of the world, floodlights of the world, not chandeliers. You know, in the book of Esther, she's this Hebrew teenager who becomes the queen of Persia, which is the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And the king, which is her husband, is about to make a really bad decision that will functionally wipe out all the Hebrew people. So she has a decision to make. Will she sit back, be quiet, protect her privilege, or will she speak up, risk her life, and defend the people of God against injustice? So in kind of the heat of her decision-making, Her cousin and functional father, Mordecai, comes to her and tells her, and this is what he says, quote, perhaps you have attained your position for such a time as this. In other words, Esther, there's something that you and only you can do, and therefore you have to do it. Only you can do that. I love what Terry said in our prayer meeting before service. He's like, every every handshake Every smile, every hug, it all matters because that's, that's a handshake, hug, and smile that only you can give. There's some conversations only you can have, some needs only you can see, some prayers only you can pray. There's some gifts only you can give, some heavy hearts that only you can lift up, some tears that only you can wipe away. There are moments in your life when God intends to bring a blessing to someone else precisely and uniquely through you. So don't get caught up in the sideline mentality. If you follow Christ, you are in. You are not sixth string. You're in the game. And so we need to be looking for those opportunities to smile, encourage, pray, bless, give, lift people up. You know... This is also how the story of Jesus goes. It was important for him to know who he was before he goes out and does God's work. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 3, it's when he's getting 
baptized. This is before miracles, before, even before the temptation in the desert, before the Sermon on the Mount when he tells everybody, you're the salt of the earth and light of the world. He gets baptized and there's a word from heaven. This is my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. The father is saying, this is who you are. Jesus wasn't working for the approval of the father. Jesus was working from it. He got it, and then he began to go and do the great things that he did. And we should follow in that same pattern. God's not waiting till you hit some like extra spiritual, really great Christian, good at ministry benchmark before he says, this is my son, this is my daughter, whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. You have that affirmation. The moment you say yes to Jesus, when God sees you, he sees Jesus. And so you have the same affirmation that Jesus got. The voice from heaven wasn't just for Jesus. It was first and primarily for Jesus, but it wasn't only for him. You too have that as your banner, as your name. That's true about you. One last thing I want to share as the band's coming up. Um, you know, I have three little daughters, five, three, and one. And when I used to drop the five-year-old off at preschool, now I do it for the, the three-year-old when I drop her off for preschool. Um, I want her to know who she is. And so I'll do little, like, declarations, daddy-daughter declarations. And I'll say, you're beautiful. And she'll say, ote, ote. I'll say, you're strong, ote. <laughs> you're not gentle, but you're working on it. Um, <laughs> you're fun, you're silly, you're smart, you're brave. You're kind, and I love you, and God loves you even more than I do. So I, I tell her those things for a lot of different reasons. Uh, first off, because I don't want her to be impressed with the first guy who tells her that 15 years from now. I want her to be like, uh, yeah, you think I'm pretty? Great. My dad's been telling me that for a long time. What else you got? <laughs> That's what I'm hoping for. We'll see. But secondly, and more importantly, I, I want her to know who she is. I want her to know that she has my approval and my love and my blessing before she comes home from school, before she can come with a good report of how the day went. Now, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that with God, and it's not going to work like that with me as your dad. I love you just as you are. I, I don't want my daughters or me to be addicted to applause, and I don't want them to be crushed by criticism either. I want them to be so convinced of God's love for them that they can, take, they can take the challenges. They can take the setbacks and failures and the mess-ups. They can take it because they know the most important opinion in the world has already been decided. It's who you are. Sure, they already have a name. Who we think we are changes everything we do. It's true for my three-year-old daughter. It's true for this 36-year-old preacher, and it's true for you. Who you think you are matters. So let's remember today who Jesus says we are. Let's pray together. Jesus, we look to you to give us our name. We build our lives on you. We rely on you. We trust you. We need you to tell us who we are. Help us to not listen to the internet to tell us who we are, to our enemies to tell us who we are, or even our family and friends, that your voice would be loudest. It would be the first, the last, and the loudest voice that we hear today and every day. So God, I, I'm hoping that you would use this service and this sermon this morning just to simply remind us who we are, that as we leave this place to go and make a difference, we would do it in your name. Because we love you and we need you. We glorify you now. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.